Learning Objective 3-4, make calculations for the consolidation of a less than wholly owned subsidiary. I know it's where there's a non-controlling interest. And again, where are we? We did Chapter 2 with wholly owned. Now we're going to do partially owned subsidiary where the investment equals the book value. And then Chapters 4 and 5, we're going to look at situations where there's a differential. In other words, where the investment exceeds the book value. That is the consideration paid by the parent to acquire the sub. And if it's a wholly owned sub, that'll be Chapter 4. And Chapter 5 is going to cover a partially owned subsidiary where there's a non-controlling interest. So the standards require that the entire income and value be reported, including both the parent share of the sub and the non-controlling interest share of the sub. What that means is that the net assets of the subsidiary are going to need to be divided between the parent share and the non-controlling interest share. And um, let me now go through this Exam these examples. So as I said before, net income is going to be equal to the parent's income from its sub, from its own operations, um, plus the net income from all of the consolidated subsidiaries. Now I don't know why it says here excluding any investment income from consolidated subsidiaries plus the net income in each. Uh, because this is going to be excluded later on. Don't worry about it. So if you own all of your subsidiaries, then all the net income of the sub is just going to get added in with the parents. If one of them is, one of the subsidiaries has a non-controlling interest, then a portion of the income of that non-controlling interest is going to need to be allocated to the non-controlling interest and therefore subtracted from consolidated net income as I showed you before. And here's an example that shows that to you again. Um, this is just an example from the book. You have Push's net income of 120 minus the equity method income from Shove plus Shove's income. Because what happened is, is that Push is using the equity method. We're going to come back to this and you're going to see how it comes back. So what you have is total Push's net income. Push accounts for Shove using the equity method. So they take their share of income from shove and they add it into their own income. You got to take it back out again. And then you add in shove's total net income in order to arrive at consolidated net income. Then you take out income attributable to the non-controlling interest in order to arrive at income attributable to the parent or to the controlling interest. Now you're saying, what's the point of doing this? Because this number is identical to this number. What this does is this gives tells you what consolidated net income is. That's your bottom line. It's not really at the bottom, but that's really the bottom line of the income statement. And we got to know what that is. So this is a way at arriving at what your consolidated net income is. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to take the parent's total net income. Parent is using the equity method. So it recorded some income of the sub, but not all of it, only their share of the income. And we're going to take that equity method income back out again. We're going to back it out and we're going to add in the subs total net income in order to arrive at consolidated net income. Consolidated net income, that's the bottom line. That's what we love. That's what we really want to see. Then we subtract out the income attributable to the non-controlling interest in order to get the net income, the parent share of net income, or it should say parent share of consolidated net income. And retained earnings is not going to take in all of the consolidated income because retained earnings is only the income that belongs to the shareholders. So what you're going to do is retained earnings is only going to include net income attributable to the parents. In other words, this hundred twenty thousand dollars, because the five thousand that's attributable to the non-controlling interest is going to go to the non-controlling interest. So when you have this $125,000, it's going to get split like follow. Non-controlling interest goes to non-controlling interest on the balance sheet, and the parent share is going to go to retained earnings. Now, as long as the parent is using the equity method, and they, write, they explain here that it's the fully adjusted equity method. That's an important little asterisk. We haven't talked about the fully adjusted yet because we haven't gotten into the later chapters. But fully adjusted is important. If the parent properly applies the equity method, then 
income on the books of the parent is going to be equal to the parent's share of net income. In other words, this number right here. This $120,000 is going to be equal to income attributable to controlling interest. If the parent didn't use the equity method, let's say that they reported income when they got dividends, then they've got to back out whatever they recorded in order to arrive at consolidated net income. So assume that push purchases 80% of shove stock and uses the equity method. Assume that income and dividends are as follows. So PUSH's retained earnings is 400, net income is 120, that includes $20,000 from SHOVE, right? That'd be 25,000 times 80%, minus their dividends equals any retained earnings. And then for the following year, their, their net income minus dividends equals any retained earnings. From SHOVE's perspective, you have re beginning retained earnings, plus net income minus dividends equals retained earnings. But you got to remember when you look at shove that 80% belongs to the parent and 20% belongs to the non-controlling interest. So pushes retained earnings after two years is $608,000. Push has recorded in the first year they recorded 25000 income from shove in the second year they reported 35,000 income from shove times 80 percent they don't record the whole thing because they're using the equity method right they use they report their share of the income from the sub so that'd be 25,000 times 80 percent plus 35,000 times 80 percent i'm using the distributed property of math my kids by the way are very impressed that i know math they're like, wow, you know what the distributive property was? We thought that these are just things you learn in school and nobody really knows them. Anyway, Push's retained earnings then adjusted would be 560. And then they report their share of the income, which is again $48,000. And you wind up exactly where you were, $608,000. And you're probably saying like, why are you doing this? You just, you know, you do all this work and then you wind up, it's like driving around in circles. You know, you wind up exactly where you start. No, no, it's very important to do this. Because companies don't always apply the equity method properly. They might use something called the um, regular, or what's called, what I like to call the dirty equity method, where they don't adjust for differentials. We haven't learned about that yet, but we're going to do it in chapters four and chapters four and five. So they might use the dirty equity method, or alternatively, they might use the cost method which is like how you account for marketable securities where all you do is when you receive a dividend you record income in which case you would have to undo whatever the company did in order to get it the parents retained earnings itself without the sub and then add their proper share of income from the sub in order to arrive at consolidated retained earnings So it's very important to understand that we have the retained earnings of the parent includes their share of the sub and the non-controlling interest share of the sub is going to go to the non-controlling interest in net assets on the balance sheet. And as long as the parent uses the equity method, things are going to go and uses it properly things will go pretty smoothly. But if the parent starts to fool around and uses the dirty equity method, um, which we haven't learned about yet, or if they use the cost method, which we haven't learned very much about, but it's basically where you just, whenever they get dividends, they record income, then they're going to need to undo that before they add their proper share of income from the sub.